We've been in the series of messages on conversations with Jesus, where each week we look at uh, uh, a little dialogue that the Lord has with sometimes the people very close to him and sometimes with total strangers, and uh, look to see how we can apply that in our lives. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a message, it, it was called, um, Ain't No Trailer Hitches on a Hearse, right? Ain't No Trailer Hitch on a Hearse, the Tennessee phrase, you know, so um, that explains so much. But, um, and, uh, and the passage this week that we're going to look at is very, very similar, and, uh, and it's a very similar theme. And so I want to ask you, because you probably know this, because you, you're all Bible students and scholars, right? What's the subject that Jesus taught most on in his earthly ministry? Money. That's what it was, money. See, you guys are biblical scholars. Some of you thought, you know, spiritualness or the kingdom of God or prayer or something like that. No, he talked about money all the time. And, uh, and that's why, you know, us preachers, we never talk about it because <laughs> we don't need to because the Lord talked about it, so that's okay. But uh, this passage, um, is, a, is to me it was really interesting because it comes in the context in Luke uh, chapter uh, 12 um, it follows uh, Jesus uh, teaching about the Lord's Prayer in, in chapter 11 and then it goes into all kinds of uh, issues of life and death and discipleship and as, he, as he's been teaching about these very very severe uh, important uh, uh, difficult issues Verse 13, someone in the crowd says to him, Rabbi, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Totally out of context. Completely like, whoa, where did this come from? Um, obviously it was on his mind. Jesus replied, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to him, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A person's life does not consist in the abundance of the possessions. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store the crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and then I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you got plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, you idiot. That's the Greek. This, this very night, tonight, your life is demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And then Jesus said, this is how it'll be with anyone who stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. And then Jesus told his disciples, therefore, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or about your body or what you'll wear. Life is more than food and the body's more than clothes. So Lord, teach us. Teach us what life's all about and how we might live freely as we follow you. That's our need today, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, what do we do with this? Well, there's a lot of issues that come up in this. And um, I need, I'm gonna share some personal things today, so um, if you don't like that, it's too bad. <laughs> you know? uh, and uh, um, th this is an issue that I have wrestled with my whole life. And that is, there's, um, have you ever watched that show Hoarders on TV? You ever watch that? That scares me, you know? I think watches that too much. That really scares me. Okay, so on, on one hand, say it's picture like a graph here. On one end of the graph, you have hoarders, right? And you can see them on TV or <laughs> look around at yourself. But, um, and then over here, you have squanderers, right about here, okay? And, um, and they're very different, but both of them are uh, missing the point about what God would have happen in our lives. One of them is so afraid of loss or they think that their possessions are, are definitions of their life and they, they, they can't let go of anything and everything uh, loses perspective and value and it's all, it's all necessary, whether it's a piece of paper or whether it's a diamond ring, it's the, it's the same, nothing can be thrown out. Over here the squanderers go, uh, you know, just blow it, 
just get rid of it, use it, uh, do something fun, you know. And um, and I admit that in, in my life, at different times, I've probably been in, in both camps. Maybe not simultaneously, sometimes I flip back and forth. But if, so if you were to do your evaluation on this graph here, between hoarding and squandering, where would you put yourself? Is that too difficult to, to think of? Or, or maybe you should just pick a person near you and say, where would you put them? You know, <laughs> is that easier? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can't put yourself in the middle. That's cheating. You know, oh, I'm right in the middle. No, you're not. <laughs> so we have that. Now, what's the alternative from uh, hoarding and squandering? Do we just have to go back and forth between them? No. And, and that's what Jesus spent most of his ministry talking about. With the disciples, with the crowds, with strangers, he talked about being stewards of, of God's gifts and, and what he's done in our life, in our world. And all of these things, and he talks about that, that we're stewards of it. We're not possessors and hoarders who are defined by our stuff. And we're not squanderers who are just flagrantly going out and without thought and without purpose, just blowing it. We're stewards. And we, and we don't understand quite what that means in practical ways. But we have issues that, that surface and, uh, and can, um, can keep us from experiencing the life that, that Christ came to give us and that he wants to give to us. Um, now, when I look at this passage, um, the first thing I noticed is that um, Jesus uh, just ref doesn't deal with it. He just doesn't, says, I, I'm, I'm not dealing with this. No, I won't. You know, so, because the man came and, and said, you know, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. Rabbi, no, actually, for rabbis, that actually was a pretty common thing. They would make judgments in the towns and the villages. And people would come to the rabbi. They were like circuit court judges in some ways. And they would make decisions about family issues and, and life issues and, and help people with that. So he says, hey, rabbi, tell him. Now, we don't know from this passage whether or not the guy uh, is being uh, like the, the brother's withholding from him. So he's not getting his, his share of the inheritance. Could be, or it could be that he wants the brother to, to break up the inheritance and give him his part and let him go. Could, could be, either one. Could be something else. But Jesus goes, no. See, the funny thing was, the guy wasn't asking for Jesus to, you know, hear both sides and make kind of a judicial decision, make a good decision. He wasn't asking him for that. What was he asking for? Tell my brother to give it to me. <laughs> That's it. Boom. <laughs> tell my brother. You tell my brother. He just goes, I'm not getting in that. And uh, I don't know if he went, but I, he might have. <laughs> the text doesn't say. But, um, and, and so he just bypasses it totally, but he, instead he goes there and he hits right at the point. Greed. Where we are so aware of what we don't have. Or we are so consumed with what someone else got that we didn't. You know, I have a theory that if everybody has nothing, we're not jealous. I don't want the nothing that they got, you know. It's only when somebody gets something that then we go, oh, wait a minute, hold on there. What's my cut in this, you know? And then we start thinking, and then our mind gets consumed with Issues of fairness, of equity, right? Imbalance. Pretty soon we start looking at what we have. And well, that's not enough, because look over here. What's being kept from me? What I should have got? What I might have? And, and pretty soon our, our, our mind is filled with thoughts of our possessions. And um, you know what we lose? We lose any sensitivity to relationships. <coughs> that now goes out the window. 
because everything's defined by this. And um, I, uh, some of you know, uh, everybody has their issues, you know, everybody has um, their 12 steps. Mine was that uh, for many years I was a compulsive gambler. And um, it was, uh, it, it was. I think I was born into it, you know, how some people are born to do their thing. And uh, my grandfather ran the Hollywood Park racetrack. So it was like horse racing was our family. I don't think my mom ever missed an opening day at the races up till the year she died. One of the last things she did was she and my dad went to um, Churchill Downs to the Kentucky Derby. Uh, because before there was cable television, they would have Churchill Downs send all the special glasses and souvenir stuff and everything like that to my grandfather's house, and they'd have their own Kentucky Derby party on the West Coast. Uh, and uh, and so it was just kind of part of my life. And I don't think, I never saw my mom lose a bet. In fact, they even framed her winning ticket on her last Kentucky Derby, you know. And so, uh, but she didn't care anything about it. It was just something she did. I, on the other hand, have this, this interesting thing going on in my brain where I have a combination of greed and magic thinking. <laughs> right there. Greed and magic thinking. Now you all know what greed is, okay? And at least I'll talk to this thing. You all know what greed is. Oh, now the magic thinking people, they're a little nervous about. What that is, is where you think you can actually control the world with your mind. And if you're a, a, a gambler, that's really dangerous. Because you know what? <clears throat> they call it gambling for a reason. You can't control the world with your mind. And so, and so I would, um, I, I lost days, you know, and all those things. And so I had to go on the wagon and, um, you know, confess it and deal with it. And, um, and we have very strict limitations in our home now about what I can and can't do, you know. And, uh, and I have to watch that. And I realized I, I wasn't really being a hoarder. I didn't think I was being a squanderer. I thought that I was being a good steward with my gambling. But I was really feeding an addiction. And it wasn't uh, kingdom living. It wasn't what God wanted for me. And I had to uh, come to grips with that. And then, and then I realized that that can carry over into other parts of life. And uh, It can carry over to ministry. It can carry over into all kinds of things where you think you can actually control things. And, um, and you can do what no one else can do. And so God's had to work on me, kind of reshaping uh, the rev here and um, doing some some carving on me and and showing me where limits are and showing me what he wants to do that's different from what I want to do or could do and to help me live beyond myself. Because left to myself, it probably wouldn't be all that healthy. Now something happens when we um, start talking about money and things like that. And I don't know why that is because, you know, I, all my life, I've worked with sincere people who want to follow Jesus and, and want to live a, a, a Christian life, and, and they, they want the Lord to be uh, in the center of their life. But when it comes to the money issue and stewardship, they really kind of block. And I, I was reading, uh, Bill Hybels had a, a book, um, Christians in the Marketplace, and this is his observation. Most Christians earnestly pray to God to guide them into the career that will best suit their talents and bring them pleasure and satisfaction. Then they pray for the strength to pursue that career and diligence for the perseverance to continue in spite of difficulties and setbacks. Then they pray for the wisdom and the skill that will lead to advancement. However, when God graciously answers their prayers and blesses their efforts so that they're rewarded with financial gain, they all too often pocket the paycheck and say, it's mine, all mine, I work for it, I sacrifice for it, I claim it, and I will enjoy it any way I want, it's mine. The Bible teaches us from cover to cover that obedience to Christ involves yielding to him the totality of our lives 
It demands that we say, here I am, here's my life, here's my sins, there's my assets, my liabilities, my strengths, my weaknesses, they're yours. Take all that I am and all that I have and mold it into conformity with your will. And most believers are willing to surrender to God their broken relationships, their frustrated ambitions, and a host of other sin-related problems that make all too obvious their need for God's forgiveness and his power. But few believers are really willing to surrender to him their possessions and their personal finances. They cling to these as their right, their security, and their reward. Is he correct in that observation? Is he seeing that right? We pray for God to bless our work and our life and heal our thing. But this one thing we say, Lord, keep your hands off that. That's mine. Now, I look at this passage, and uh, it's interesting because there's a, a Greek word that actually is very similar to the, the French word, by the way. You know, linguistics here. Uh, the word for mine is uh, mon, like you would M O N, like mon ami something like that. And, and through this passage, that word is used over and over and over and over again. He told them a parable. The man thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, Self, you got plenty of good things. Take life easy. And then God said to him, You fool, this night your, your life, your life will be demanded from you. We're taking your life back. Do you see this, the rhythm of that? It's mine, it's mine, it's mine, and I'll do what I do, and this is what I do, and, and everything. And then God says, you know, actually, your life's not yours. Your life is not yours. And what are you going to do with all that stuff anyway? Now, how do we live? How do we live so that we're not... Defined, limited, uh, held back, controlled by our um, possessions. How can we learn uh, to be uh, seeing, not just, uh, you know, I grew up, you know, you were supposed to tie 10% of everything you have. You know, Jesus said, yes, do that and more, everything. And I, and I thought, well, then that's good because then 90% I'm keeping for myself. So get off my back, Lord, because, you know, I gave you that 10%. So now I'm all right. And, um, and then I did, you know, I've had to come to grips with, well, what if we said, no, actually, everything is yours, Lord. How do we steward everything you have? And there's no, no more mine. That's a tough one for me to deal with, okay? I don't know about you guys, but for me, that's a tough one. I, I kind of like that mine thing uh, as, a, as a controlling kind of person. And I think there's a fear... That, that we won't have enough. So we have to control this because what if we get to a place where we won't have enough? Or there won't be there for us. And the other part of it is, well, I want to use it really well and really perfectly so I'm not going to do anything with it until the right thing comes. And so we're stuck in both, both places. Now, I told you about... Um, this guy uh, years ago. In fact, I met. I ran into him at a party recently, and um, and he said, "John, something that you, a conversation you and I had thirty years ago, has changed my entire life." I went, "Whoa, <laughs> really?" And I knew what he was talking about, though. He was the guy who we had lunch. He invited me to lunch, a really nice place downtown, and then asked me. He said, you know, when you do the offering prayer, you always say there's tithes and offerings, and you go, I don't get the difference, you know. So I told him about, you know, take 10% of your income off the top and, and uh, give that to the Lord, and then the Lord becomes a partner in your finances. You become financial partners with the Lord. 
And he went, wow, I never thought of that. I thought God just wanted my spiritual life. I didn't know he cared about this other side. I said, well, you know. He goes, was that pre-tax or, or after tax? <laughs> I went, you know, it doesn't say, you know, so whatever. And he said, I've got to do Then he went, you think I should talk to my wife? Should I tell her? Oh, yeah, probably that's a good idea. You know? And then he went, it's kind of scary because there's a lot. I go, it's only 10%. He went, yeah, 10% of yours is one thing. 10% of mine is different. <laughs> anyway, that was our conversation. And, uh, and he said it changed like, and, and, uh, and I know that's true because over the years I've heard about how he has funded ministries, urban ministries, young life ministries, uh, international ministries, uh, churches, many, many churches in this town. Um, and his jobs keep changing, but he just seems to keep prospering and he just, is doing that. And a couple of years ago, he finally just set up a big family foundation to just keep giving as many ways as he can. And I thought, man, I, 30 years ago, really, changed his life, and yet it didn't change mine. See? Uh, it was only recently that, that I went, what would happen if I actually did what I say I believe? What, wouldn't that be weird? For the preacher to actually do what they say they, they believe or what they're telling you to do? Now, we've always done the, the tithing because Eileen's kind of legalistic, you know, and she handles the money. So uh, that's, that's always been not an issue for me. But then it was like God started working on me. What does it mean when we say our whole life's in God's hands and let him uh, deal with it? Take him at his word. And, uh, and that came up about a year ago or so. Um, about the time when I realized that the church couldn't afford me and, uh, and paying my salary. So I came up with a plan. Now, this is a Westfall plan, okay? This is my plan I was going to, you know, present. What we'll do is I won't take the salary now, but we'll just build a debt month by month of my unpaid salary over a couple of years. And then when I retire, that'll be a great retirement account. And the church can pay me back in perpetuity. <laughs> Wasn't that a good, that's a pretty good thing, right? Church doesn't have to pay. Don't pay now, pay later, you know. And uh, and then I'll have the security down the road. I love this idea. And then I shared it with Eileen and she didn't love it. She said, why would you saddle the church with debt? Well, it's not debt, it's just, you know, what they owe me. You know, why would you do that? Well, I don't know why, okay? okay this is, uh, and then the more, and then and then, and then as God kept working on me and he finally went, why don't you just give back your salary to the church and then they're not out anything. And I went, well, that's stupid. That's a dumb idea. And I shared it with Eileen and I was happy to hear her say, well, what if we can't make it? What if we don't, we can't live like that? I went, I don't know. <laughs> That's God's problem, you know. But I thought, you know, she's probably right, too. And so, anyway, so we stopped that back last fall. And um, no kidding now, I'm looking at it after about a year or so. Every single month, God still provided. It's the weirdest thing. It's totally weird. We even, after, you know, over all those years we couldn't qualify to get a house, this was the year, the year that I get no salary, that, that we got approved for the home loan so that we could buy, buy our house. Isn't that weird? Say it with me. That is weird. Say it. Yeah, that's weird. Can you believe that? The year I get nothing, that's the year they say approved. In fact, this is a really funny thing. It's small, but it's funny. So uh, we lost our home, you know, years ago in, in Minnesota to, to Bank of America, the evil empire. Satan rules there, you know. And uh, just an editorial thought. And uh, so what happens is um, I kept trying to get a, a credit card from uh, Alaska Airlines. And theirs is run by Bank of America. So for the last six years, they have turned me down every time. Every time. Until last night. I thought, well, what the heck? Let's just see, you know, since I'm getting no salary and everything, 
let's try it again. So I went online and I applied, and within two minutes, I was approved. <laughs> that is weird. Say it with me. That is weird. Okay, so now I'm not saying, you know, uh, God brings prosperity. If you do, I don't, I don't believe in that, you know, name it and claim it stuff. I don't believe any of that. If you have faith, you'll get rich and stuff. All I'm saying is, I had to take the challenge because I was a man who was greedy and trying to control things with my mind. I was a gambler. And I had to say, Lord, what if I actually let you be Lord even of the finances? Even there. I guess he's got a lot of time in that area because not everybody does that. But I'm going, why didn't I do this 30 years ago like my friend that I advised? He's had 30 years of, of knowing that God's his partner and I've only been just dinking around on the sides. So anyway, all of this, uh, I want to make a challenge for you. Maybe not a new one for you. Uh, maybe old time for you. But um, for any of you who have uh, not felt the courage to even begin with the tithe, uh, the 10% of your income, and say, Lord, here's this for you. It, 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 if you were to do this, this is, this is my, my commitment to you. I, I guarantee this, okay? I guarantee this. If you were to do a biblical tithe, 10% of your income, and trust the Lord, make God your partner. If six months down the road or, ne or a year or two weeks or whatever it is, if you don't feel that God's been a good partner, if he's been a bad partner and uh, you're worse off because of it, you will get every penny back. That's my commitment to you. And I'm doing this without talking to the elders. <laughs> well, they're going to hear it today. So there you go. So that's our guarantee. And uh, uh, you can't lose. So if you get afraid and you go, well, what if everything goes wrong? Give me a call. You get all your money back. Money back guarantee. Just because I believe so much that if we take God at his word, he will be there for us and with us as he said he would. The difficulty is we don't take him at his word. Particularly in this area. So, I guarantee it. I am, I am absolutely guaranteeing that if you were to take this challenge, you'll get a money back guarantee if God doesn't honor his part of it. That's how serious I am about um, <coughs> believing in God's partnership particularly in our finances. Okay. Now I'm probably going to have to deal with leadership issues on this, but, you know, there you go. <laughs> I'm the one with the microphone, so there you go. <laughs> so, all right. That's the challenge. Once again, this is what Jesus tells us. So, Lord Jesus, have your way in us. Have your way in every one of us. Have your way in every part of us. Lord, we would not hold back, and we ask that you would not hold back. And that you would show us that you never leave us, you never forsake us, you don't abandon us, and you're with us always, even in our finances. And we'll give you the glory. Amen.